we are, we are moving more and more towards solid state detectors. And the reason for that is the following. So first, the energy that you require for an electron ion pair creation is about 30 electron volts. It's relatively high. You know, you need to drift electrons and all that. It's slow. So we benefited from the progress in the, in the integrated circuit industry. We employ solid state detectors. And what we employ is silicon. I'm sure you know about silicon, and I dare say that silicon runs the world at the moment. So what are the advantages of silicon? So first of all, the energy that you require to ionize the medium is very small, 3.6, very fast, has much better resolution, it's, it's rigid, and all of that. So let's look at silicon. So silicon is element number 14 has four electrons in its outer shell, has a diamond crystal structure. So each atom has four neighbors and has four perfect covalent bonds. Now, you all know the shell structure of an atom. They have an atom, and these electrons circle around the atom. And they can occupy specific shells. Now, I take two atoms. And I bring them together. What happens? They exchange electrons. That, that also. But what happens to the shells? The, they hybridize into Correct. So, but let me say it a bit easier. So what happens is you have these these levels, these energy levels, very discrete energy levels. And when I bring these together, or when I bring a whole bunch of them together, I get bands of energy. And then depending on what element it is, these bands of energies have a very particular structure. So what I can have, for example, is I can have one continuous band. So these electrons can occupy any level. When I have that, I have a conductor, like iron, or aluminum, or copper. What I can have is I can have a gap in between, a very big gap. And then I have an insulator, like glass. Or what I can have is I can have a gap, but a relatively small gap. And then I have a semiconductor. And silicon is a semiconductor. Now, if I now have a particle that goes through here, it ionizes this. So what happens is I can take one of these electrons from this covalent bond and liberate. And this electron can travel freely through the lattice. So currents in a semiconductor is described as two ways, either as the, the motion of an electron but the electron leaves a hole, leaves a gap. And this hole can also travel, because this electron can move there, and then the hole migrates here. So I had the conduction is the conduction of electrons in this conduction band and holes in the valence band. Now, we can do some magic with silicon. So silicon is here and has some neighbors. <coughs> Neighbors that have one electron less or one electron more in the outer shell. And then we can dope it. <laughs> what do we mean by doping in silicon? So what we can do is in this lattice, we can put a group three element in here that has naturally one electron missing. Or we can put a group five element here that has naturally one electron too many. When we do that, we change the, char the electrical characteristics of silicon completely. And this is how we make uh, diodes. This is how we make transistors. And it's all integrated in one piece of silicon. <coughs> This, and I will stop here, but you can read upon this. This is 
how your laptop works. This is how your cell phone works. This is how a digital camera works. This is the fundamental principle which I dare say runs the world. Because without the semiconductor industry, I think we will be at a complete loss. Now, how do we use it? Let me skip this. The way we use it is as follows. So here you have, um, we make silicon strip factories. So here you have a piece of silicon, and we dope it. We dope it with a P plus material that is a, a group three element. So we create here holes. And then we, we repeat this pattern. And if an electron or if a charged particle goes through, we get a signal and we collect that signal. Now the advantage here is that these signals are very fast, but the biggest advantage is that the difference in distance between two readout signals can be as small as 25 microns. Your hair is about 40 microns. So that is what then gives us a phenomenal resolution for determining where the fault is. <coughs> so if we need to know very accurately where a particle went, we always use silicon. Okay. So now we come to some examples of the factories, okay? So if we want to design a detector, we of course want to know what we want to measure. You have to guess what the anticipated signature is, how well we need to measure it, what are the backgrounds, what are the constraints, and what are the boundary conditions. For example, here at the Tevatron, we have these beams of protons and antiprotons. They collide every 326 nanoseconds. So if you have a detector that gets a signal out every microsecond, forget about it. It's too slow. Okay? and all of that. And then, again, there's a strategy. So what is more important for you? Um, because a detector employs many different detection techniques. So if you s suppose you want to measure the trajectory of a particle very accurately, you cannot first have the particle go through a big, you know, honking piece of steel, because that would deflect it, it would interact there already. Right? So there are certain priorities that you have to 